well, few generals or lieutenants may come in any moment and at the point of a gun send him out. Send him where? To prison or a better place. His personal life is in danger. His being president is in danger. Then he must think of it, and he doesn't. And this is the tragic part of this kind of regime of people. Dictators are supposed to be very uh, brave people. It isn't so. It isn't true. They're afraid. They don't trust anybody uh, around them, their dearest friends. Look what Stalin did to his people. Uh, look how Sadat started. The first thing is sending people to jail. And uh, I don't know, how does he take his decisions like, uh, like I do? We sat at cabinet meeting today from 9 o'clock to 3 o'clock, discussing things, different people's opinion, we have to take votes. I don't know whether he has, uh, gets his ministers together and asks their advice. I don't know whether he doesn't get up one morning and says, well, now I'll do this, and doesn't. So this element, which is supposed to be a question of philosophical uh, problem, what kind of regime of a social problem. Really, in a situation of this kind in the Middle East, it's a question of life and death to many, many people. Well, are the Russians coming back in now? Do you think Sadat has decided to have them back? Well, look what Sadat did, I imagine. When that bright morning, he decided to tell the Russians, go home, I suppose what he thought was, now, the Americans don't like the Russians. So, if I send the Russians home, the Americans will applaud me. And then they'll come running and say, well, now, President Sadat, you're wonderful. Now you've sent the people we don't like away. Now just tell us what you want. You want us to squeeze Israel? Okay, with that. that's just what we're going to try, begin to do this afternoon. Uh, well, the Americans didn't do it. So he said, okay, uh, the Americans are now involved in uh, the political campaign, and the Jews are so influential, of course, without them there's no president elected in the United States, so never mind uh, the president, and I'm going to go to Western Europe. Here is uh, the place where I can get things. And he sent his messengers to Western Europe. Nothing happened. And uh, the Americans don't help him. Western Europe doesn't help him. So now he's going to scare the Americans a little bit again. He's going back to the Russians. And he went back to the Russians. Here another phase of all this. Connected, of course, with everything that I said before. The lack of, call it courage, or whatever you wish to call it, of knowing that you're a sovereign state a sovereign people, you have to carry the responsibility for your decisions and for your people. Don't expect somebody to do things for you. You've gone to war, you Egypt, not so bad, so it was nice, it doesn't make any difference. Out of the blue in 67, you sent your army across the canal into the Sinai Desert, and uh, uh, Nasser said, this is the day. Now we're going to do it. Fine, you tried. Couldn't succeed. Now, Israel immediately after the war says, okay, now let us sit down and negotiate a peace treaty. And the answer was no, no, no. The Americans will squeeze Israel. They remembered 56, 57, the Americans and the Russians will do it, and I'll sit back and threaten Israel. The Americans don't do it quick enough, I'll start a war of attrition. And if the Barlev line is not really destroyed, never mind, I'll tell my people, as Nasser did tell his people, two-thirds of the Barlev line is destroyed. Not two-thirds, and nothing was destroyed. You see, the lack of courage to say to the people, first let's tell them the truth, and then take responsibility. How do you Americans say? Do it yourself. Don't expect, what, is, what did uh, uh, 
What is the God been saying all the time? I'm not interested what Israel thinks. I'm not satisfied when President Nixon will tell me that he will influence Israel. Nixon must squeeze Israel. It doesn't enter his mind that Israel is not squeezable. Mrs. Mayer, is it implicit in what you've been saying that the United States and the countries of Western Europe to whom Sadat appealed, applied after the Russians left, is it implicit in what you've been saying that they somehow missed the boat and that there was something they could have done? No. No, not at all. Oh. First place, uh, with all the failures in international life and international relations and so on, there is a certain basis of, of uh, justice, of honesty, of decency. And when we say we're prepared to negotiate, and when we say we're even prepared to uh, carry on indirect negotiations, well, what, what else is expected of us? What should be expected of us? Certainly the United States has adopted an attitude that uh, we, we, can, we can't and should not be squeezed. The United States is prepared to help that the parties should negotiate. And I think European countries uh, did the same. And uh, now when Sadat went back to Russia, I'm not so sure whether he's so happy with what he's getting from his point of view. And uh, I don't know how things uh, will turn out. But first he sends them out and he goes back to them. And I don't say that uh, this means that, again, in the near future there will be 20,000 Russians in Egypt. But with the material that they sent, come, what do you call them, advisors, instructors, with the particles, they're coming back in small numbers, I suppose. Mrs. Mayor, there are two points I'd like to ask you about in connection with the territories Israel occupied after the Six-Day War. One has to do with the establishment of Jewish settlements, Israeli settlements in those areas. And uh, sometimes it is said that Israel is creating a fait accompli by settling in these areas, in some cases expelling Arab farmers to do so. In some cases, so it is said, um, driving people out of their houses to do so, destroying houses and the like. May we just discuss first the question of settlement. What is it you are trying to do in the occupied territory? Exactly what we're doing. In parts of the occupied territory, uh, we're putting up settlements. That's true. We are not destroying Arab houses to put up settlements. We destroyed Arab houses in the miserable refugee camp in the Gaza Strip uh, to widen the roads, right, also for security, because there were nests of uh, terrorists, but also for the welfare of the people, uh, covering up uh, the uh, storage uh, open canals that were there, and setting up other houses for them, by the way, putting in electricity and uh, water and so on. Now, I know that people say that because we're putting up settlements now, we're as though um, making it difficult uh, for Arab uh, neighbors to negotiate with us. But immediately after the war, we didn't have settlements and we were prepared to negotiate peace immediately after the war. Now, we never denied that we will not go back to the 67 borders. And we said we want changes. And certainly these settlements uh, represent changes in the borders. But that doesn't mean that we're not prepared to sit down and negotiate. On the contrary, we want to negotiate. And uh, they're not... Uh, then it isn't as though we come to a village, we drive the Arabs out, we destroy the houses and put a settlement around. Mm -hmm. There's nothing farther from the truth than uh, this. It may be that sometimes uh, somebody has to be moved a little bit, not villages, not masses, sometimes an individual house, but then always with compensation and always with rebuilding the house. No, we're, we're not angels, but we're not that bad. Well, on that point, Mr. Mayor, I was reading that not merely that houses have been destroyed, which 
you deny or explain. I want but to say this too. Yes. For instance, there have been houses destroyed in the Gaza Strip or um, very few also on the Western Bank when these houses were nest of terrorists. That, that's true, but it had nothing to do with their settlement. Uh, there's been no confiscation of land to give to Israeli farmers, for example. That, that has been written. It's land that was state land, and if it belonged to individual people, uh, bought and paid for. And if they didn't uh, uh, want to accept the money now, at any rate, it's at their disposal, and we're prepared at any moment to negotiate. Some of the land, I gather, is crown land belonging to the king. That's right. Well, that's, that's what we call state land, crown land. I, I have also read that there have been some deportations and that there have been, there have been some indefinite detention without trial in the occupied areas. Terrorists. A terrorist who some who have been caught in action have been put to trial and others who belong to terrorist organizations and uh, helped and participated and so on uh, are uh, in administrative um, arrest. Uh, that's true. Uh, less people do not know, I think maybe it's worthwhile knowing, that with all the terror that we had in the area, not one single I can't say not one single death sentence, there were one or two death sentences, but no execution of one single person. Nobody was put to death. Not one. You see, in our civil uh, laws, we d did away with capital punishment. In our military uh, courts, it is allowed for acts of war or treason or something like that. So that once or twice, the military court decided a death sentence, and it was always changed to a uh, life sentence. Because government decided in, uh, after 67 that uh, the uh, death sentence should not be required. But sometimes the judges themselves, the case is so serious that despite that, they themselves decide on death sentence, but then it is always turned into a life sentence. Mr. Mayor, I want to change the subject rather radically, I'm afraid. Uh, you were born in Kiev, you moved to Pinsk, you went to the United States in 1906 to Milwaukee. And you uh, have said, well, let's leave out Milwaukee for the moment, we'll get to that later. You're known as the mayor who made Milwaukee famous because I think you were born across from the What's Schlitz so Brewery. Was, was, was it Pabst or Schlitz that made Milwaukee famous? <laughs> but I think for the, for the sake of safety, I'll say both Schlitz and Pabst. <laughs> the beer, at any rate. <laughs> uh, but before we get to the Milwaukee part of it, you were born in Russia. You went to the United States in 1906, and you have said, if there's any logical direction that your life has taken, desire and the determination to save Jewish children from experiences like those you knew in Tsarist Russia. How much of that lives in your memory? But the Jewish people has a very long memory, collectively. And masses of individual Jews have a similar memory, a similar memory. In the United States, if there are still people of my generation, I mean, immigrants at that time, this will be a repetitious story. It won't be Kiev, then it will be uh, Vilna, then it will be uh, Kovna, it will be Bialystok, uh, it will be uh, Moscow. It'll be, it doesn't ma matter where it will be, but it's the same story, the same story. The first memory of many, many Jews, the first thing they remember, like I, is when my father and the upstairs neighbor were nailing up the doors because the rumors were that there's going to be another pogrom in Kiev. And this wasn't something that was so outlandish. There were pogroms, there were pogroms after. That, at that time, it did not happen. But the horror 
of uh, standing there and watching what our fathers were doing and knowing that it may happen, that lives in the, uh, the hearts of many people. Some people, despite that, took a different uh, road. Uh, to me, this is something that, uh, as I said, it was consciously or not unconsciously, has uh, decided my way in life. Do you find yourself having anything in common then with the Russian Jews who are now coming to Israel? Definitely, but with all Jews. Why not with Jews from the uh, Jewish children, for instance, who live in the ghetto in Syria today? And uh, know what it means uh, to live in a ghetto and under terror because they're Jewish. Or uh, what happened during the Second World War uh, under Hitler. I mean, it's, it's the same thing. It's a question of... Uh, Sovereignty, I have two generations now of my own that were born here. Uh, this is one of the greatest, maybe the greatest thing in my person, the greatest thing in my personal life, certainly, that I have a son and a daughter and five grandchildren who, to whom what I tell them about my childhood is a story. They know that that's modern Jewish history and ancient Jewish history, but as far as their personal life is concerned, they knew no fear of them. There were wars, that's true. My granddaughter is through with the army service now. Uh, my children were in, in all the wars, but no fear of a pogrom, the no fear of having to hide away. About the Russian Jews who are coming here now, because that is a subject, obviously, that arouses enormous interest. But do you find that the Russian government, the Soviet government, responds to pressure from the outside? Undoubtedly. Undoubtedly. This is the only thing that really can influence Russia. And look, with all that we have to say against Russia now, believe me, we have a lot to say against this. Still, we're getting some immigration, something we didn't have several years ago. Now, Stalin didn't, he couldn't have cared less what the world thought about him or about Russia. Khrushchev was different. These people certainly are different, and the situation in Russia is such. I must give credit to these people at least for one thing, even if it hurts me. They, they have a situation in, in, uh, among their people and their country. They are uh, desperately in need of help in the Western world. They have the courage to go to the Western world and ask for it and try to, to come to some arrangement where they can get it. There's no doubt pressure from the West, from, from the world, that people should, uh, cannot be treated that way. People, that, what, after all, what do the Jews want in Russia? They want to go to Israel. They're not going out to attack Russia. They should be allowed to do it without misery, without being sent to prison, without being sent to insane asylums, without being sent to Siberia. Do you have any idea how many of them want to come out? Nobody has any idea. And if sometimes we hear from the Russians say very few Jews want to come out, all the more reason that they really believe that it's only very few Jews to let them go. And if it proves that there are many, let the many go. Every three countries does that too because they could have had so much goodwill if they let the people go. And I hope they still will come to that conclusion. What is happening now, they are sending, allowing some people to go. Then they put ransom on people. Then some people they send to Siberia. And instead of gaining goodwill, they're destroying it. Mr. Mayor, there used to be a lot of talk, maybe it was a lot of guesswork about the absorptive capacity of Israel. How many people you could actually have in this country support? How many people could actually support themselves, I should say? Is there a current figure that the Israeli government has in mind on that? You know that <coughs> between the day that the Great Britain got the mandate over Israel and the day of in, uh, and our independence, I think there were 20 odd royal commissions that came uh, so one royal commission once said, 
you can't, the, the country is so overcrowded that uh, you can't uh, uh, turn a cat, swing a cat. Who wanted to swing cats? We wanted to have people in the country. <laughs> then another royal commission said, not one more drop of water in this country. And of course, absorptive capacity, that was the problem. And uh, Dr. Weitzman once said, what is absorptive capacity? Every Jew that comes to then Palestine, in his suitcase, there's absorptive capacity for a few more Jews. And here we are. Now the population is uh, very, very close to three million. And now we know that so much of our country is still uncultivated and not settled. And things are developing instead of a track of a farm of so many acres which were necessary for a family when we didn't have irrigation, there were no modern methods of agriculture. Now that same plot can support four families. And then industry and science and technology, there's no limit really, uh, no limit. We're not a people of 200 million. But so the numbers that we have, we can take. Was there ever a time, Mrs. Mayor, when you were in the United States, where you lived for quite a while, that you thought of staying there? that you thought you might be an American? Uh, before I came here? Yes. Well, I suppose when I, I came there when I was eight, I became a Zionist, labor Zionist to be more correct, during the uh, First World War. I didn't be join the labor Zionist party until I decided that I would come to Palestine. Somehow I couldn't understand the idea that I'm for a Jewish state, but I'll, I'll live in Milwaukee. So there weren't very many years. And uh, God knows it's not because the United States was not good to us, and be not because I didn't appreciate all that it had to generate. The difference between Zionism and the United States, but it's because of the Jewishness in me. And uh, because of this peculiar streak that if you believe something, you should uh, go and try to uh, accomplish it. So I, although I lived in the United States until I was uh, uh, 23, came here in 21. But uh, out of these years, quite a few number of years, I was involved in uh, Zionist activity. Uh, we only have about two minutes left, Mrs. Mayor, and I, I do want to ask you a bit more about the past. You arrived in Tel Aviv in July 1921. Was it hot? <laughs> you became a teacher in a kibbutz, but you also, as I've read, picked almonds, you minded chickens, and you cared for children. You were married by that time, of course. And over the years, so I've read, you have never been to a beauty parlor. You have a very limited wardrobe, you've had very little leisure. Do you regret any of it? Do you? First, first I must correct something which is more important than sure. anything else. I was not a teacher in a kibbutz. I took care of poultry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I baked bread <laughs> and washed clothes. Um, I'm a realist. And it may, I suppose, if I believe that if I go to a beauty parlor, I would really be beautiful, I suppose I would have done it. But I knew that that's, it won't help. This is it, I have to live with it. I certainly never regretted a thing in my life. Uh, I, I have more joy and satisfaction in my life than I will ever be able to tell of. When a person in his own life sees a revolution of this kind, uh, sees the Jewish people as a people of refugees, and a people that is either killed by some and pitied by the rest. A sovereign people, back in its own land, there are many problems and many troubles and so on, but still acting on its own, not pitied anymore at any rate. Uh, what else can a person want? Thank you very much, Mrs. Mayor. Thank you. Well, the Mayor has been speaking freely.
Edwin Newman, NBC News.